go once again. I'm Ken Lundin and I'm your host for the B2B Sales Summit. And I could not be more thrilled today than to have Keith Rosen with me. What is going on, my friend? All good things, Ken. All good things. A pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, oh, yeah. And we are looking forward to extrapolating and pulling some stuff out of that giant sales brain of yours because I, I know you've been doing this for a while. Absolutely. <laughs> well, for those who aren't familiar with Keith Rosen, let me talk to you a little bit. And I'm going to cheat and look down on my cheat sheet because, to be honest, there's just too much great stuff. So Keith's been a sales consultant, coach, trainer, author, all that silly stuff for a few decades now. We won't, I'm not going to give the specific years, Keith, because it makes both of us old. So he's globally recognized authority on sales and leadership. He is the CEO of CoachQuest uh, and has been named one of the best sales training, sales training and coaching companies <laughs> worldwide. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, he has been recognized by Inc. Magazine and Fast Company by, as one of the most five most influential executive coaches in the world. And he was also inducted into the inaugural group of Top Sales Hall of Fame. Now, that may not mean much to everybody listening yet, but listen to the list of people who were inducted with Keith. Zig Ziglar, Earl Nightingale, Bill Brooks, and Brian Tracy. I don't know if we have to do anything else other than just send them to your website at this point, because if that isn't... The coup de gras. I don't know what it is, man. Well, so there, I'm thrilled to have you. And, and this is this is just awesome. And we're going to talk about a couple topics today that I think are interested of anyone who, who comes in, right? Sales manager, salespeople. And a couple things that we're going to knock down today really are about how do I become more productive every single day to get more out of my life and to get more out of my career. And then the other thing we're going to transition into, which is Kind of a misnomer and a weird thing is we're going to talk some about how do I get get coached, give coaching, you know, create an environment where we succeed. So are you fired up to do this? I was fired up for the last 24 hours. I don't think I've slept in two days, Ken. <laughs> Neither has my wife, but it's because she has to actually talk to me. So wait, that's, uh, I digress. So You and me will take that offline, okay? <laughs> yeah. Is that where I'm supposed to edit? No, never mind. <laughs> so, so in your last book, which was titled Own Your Own Day, you discussed the importance of having a routine. So I want to start there as we talk about how to be productive as a sales or sales manager. Of course. It, all roads go back to time management. Let's just start there. Mm -hmm. And regardless of who I'm working with, could be a CEO of a multi-billion dollar organization to a frontline sales manager, to a salesperson, independent contributor, account executive, it doesn't matter. 99 and nine tenths of the people I've spoken to over the last 30 years, and I'm talking millions of people, right. struggle with time management. Hmm. And when I talk to people and I ask them, hey, how do you manage your day? How do you structure your day? Oh, I have a calendar. Okay, right. great. Um, is it a reflection of your ideal life? Not at all, Keith. Oh, okay. So what does your routine look like? And they would look at me like, hmm, what do you mean by routine? So first I need to even the playing field and even explain to people what is a routine? Because the first reaction a lot of people have is, ooh, routine. That sounds boring. That sounds monotonous. That well, sounds how can I be successful in sales if I have a routine, right? I need flexibility. I, I, I can't have all that structure and rigidity. I need to be creative. So these all these thoughts in our head, which are all misbeliefs, actually sabotage our very ability to design our ideal life and become hyperproductive. So the way I look at a routine is very simple. I would ask a client, listen, if I was to look at your calendar, would it be a manifestation? Would it be a reflection of not only all the activities you need to engage in on a daily basis, which is going to drive you to achieving your sales quota, your personal goals and your business objectives, while keeping your life in harmony and in balance? Hmm. I'd probably say 99 and nine tenths of the people, if not 100% would say no. Yeah, that's great. You don't and and nobody wants to hear it, but let me make sure that I, I'm going to tie these people in so they're going to watch the rest of this interview. With the early returns, we've got a few thousand people that are registered. We'll have plenty more by the time we're done. But the early returns are the top two things people have been asking about, time management and more deals. So out of all of that, people are going, oh, that's not sexy, Keith. But it's one of the top two concerns people have. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just, that's just insane. 
So yeah. does, it, does it go to the saying that you tell me and what I've seen you say is that work-life balance isn't possible anymore, yeah. right? So tell me how that, you sound like you're talking on both sides here. I need to, you know, work, work this through with me. Feel free to challenge me all the way, Ken. <laughs> uh, it, and you would think as a coach, Keith, how could you say that life balance is impossible? I mean, you're a coach. Aren't you supposed to be the eternal optimist? Well, I am, but I'm also a grounded realist. Right. And unfortunately, and give me one second here, this device right here, Mm. has made life balance unfortunately obsolete yeah so my definition over the years of life balance has evolved so let's go back bc before yeah. children before i was married right when life was all about me and i could do whatever i want i owned my day i had no other responsibilities other than me life balance was a lot more attainable and going back is before i was married that was of course before yeah. cell phones and the telephone and the TV and horse and buggy. So putting all that aside, um, I realized as I got older and I got married and then I had children, now I have three fabulous children, my definition of life balance changed. And life balance is not about equilibrium because I'm a very literal person. And when people say life balance, balance implies equilibrium. Equal balance of life and career on both sides. That's not reality anymore. Hmm. There are too many things being pulled at us, too many distractions that are being pulled at us. So my definition now is managing the imbalances in your life is what by default will create more harmony and significance in your life. And those are the things that you can bring into your life more of when you truly own your day and live from a place of intention rather than a place of reaction where most people do live from. Hmm. So tell me more about that, because what what I'm seeing, the vision I'm seeing in my, you know, small mind's eye is as follows, right? I'm seeing that you're saying managing your imbalances. So that feels to me like with my family or with work, that one day, one of them may be a 75% focus. And the next day, it may be the other one. Is that what you're speaking to? Talk to me about that. I think you're, I think you're spot on. So I always say when I'm traveling and I'm in front of an audience, I put my heart, soul, uh, and all of my energy and focus into every single participant, into every single client. They get all of me. Right. And when that's the case, I'm not home with my children or my wife or my family. So technically, to your point, I'm being a much better business person. Then conversely, I'll fly home and I'll spend time at home and I'll have breakfast, breakfast with my kids. I'll take them to school. I'll be there after they come back from school, maybe have a play date with my kids after that dinner with my family, do a little homework with them. And then I'm being the best father, best parent, best husband that I can be. Okay, in that point, maybe that scale dips a little bit on the other side. So yes, you're spot on in terms of managing those imbalances and being honest about the fact that this is going to be reflected in your routine. Hmm. Wouldn't you say that that's why, would, would I be wrong to assume since we're, this is B2B sales, man, we're talking to sales, sales managers, entrepreneurs. Isn't that why we do it is so that we could have the ability to flex more than somebody who's got to sit in a chair nine to five? True. I, I'll share with you a story that brought me to tears recently. Mm -hmm. I was working with a client, brand new client, probably our second coaching session. And we were talking about his personal vision and we were talking about his goals, which are the first things that I have any new client do. Because after all, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you're going to get there? Right. So we would work on our goals. We would work on our vision. And this one particular client, it was our second coaching session. And he said to me on the phone, he said, Keith, I am so tired of watching my children grow up through pictures. Yeah. That broke my heart. Yeah. And so here's a guy who was a workaholic, who was sacrificing his self-care, sacrificing his relationship, sacrificing everything for work. And I think that's the part where we live in a society today where people think this is unattainable. This is just how it is. I have to make sacrifices. I have to give up my personal well-being and all my hobbies and the things that bring me joy for my career. It doesn't have to be that way. Hmm. Yeah, that's insane. I bet you there are a lot of people nodding their heads and, and just kind of really feeling that. So here's what I'd like to do. So I heard you talk about the very first thing you do is set goals. So I want to start there. And then I want to move into the relevance of those goals on how we actually do things and manage our day to day. 
So talk to me about your goal setting process and then let's move through on how people can align to those better to get more out of their day and their life. Excellent, thank you. When you're traveling somewhere, and I would say usually you put your directions into your car GPS, of course, now we do it on our phone. Um, we use a GPS system to uh, get to our destination in the most efficient way possible with the least amount of risk or error. Right. As human beings, we have an internal personal navigation system. It's what I call this. And it's our internal compass. It's our North Star. It's our guiding light. Most people have not taken the time to really focus and articulate and put on paper what that looks like, what that feels like. So because of that, if we go back to that universal law of attraction, if you're not very clear with what you truly want, personally and professionally with your goals, then you're going to attract all sorts of different things in your life. Toxic relationships, bad jobs, bad opportunities, all the things you don't want rather than focusing on what you do want. So when it comes to goal setting, you just can't sit down and say, okay, what do I want? That's when people actually wind up setting the wrong goals for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a distinction here between a should-based goal and a value-based goal. Okay. Okay. So a should, and I want to make sure everyone's hearing me correctly, S-H-O-U-L-D, should-based goal versus value-based goal. So it wasn't shit-based goal. It was not that word, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've been overly conditioned never to use explicits like this. That's, uh, okay. hey, that's all right. I'll cross the line for you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so when you look at a should-based goal, that's going to sound something like this. I'm a new salesperson. I get It's a first day on, on my new job. I'm looking around. I want to be as successful as possible. I go and I talk to the top salesperson in the organization and I ask them, what's your secret to success? And they tell me, you know what, Keith? The secret to my success is I work seven days a week, 15 hours a day. That's the secret to my success. Now, here I am thinking, okay, wait a second. I'm a new salesperson on the job, first day there. I want to be as successful as possible. I'm going to do what this person does. So I set a goal. I say, I want to be as successful this, as this person. So I should work 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Except there's a problem. You see, one of my core values is self-care, my family, my children, my personal time. Mm -hmm. Now, think about that. If... I'm focused on a should-based goal, which is, gee, I guess I should work 14 hours a day, seven days a week. That's going to compromise my integrity. And integrity is what you do to make yourself whole and complete. So if I look at my integrity, and part of my integrity and my value system is I value self-care, I value personal time, I value that time with my family, I value that balance we talked about, well, you're going to continually feel off and out of integrity because you're not honoring your core values. So that now bleeds into, well, okay, Keith, how do I actually set a value-based goal? Right. So I want everyone to imagine um, an inverse funnel, okay? Now, there's a saying there, um, and I, of course, give full attribution, Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. Yeah. Now, with deep respect, I'm going to add to that quote. It's begin with the end in mind while focusing on today. Oh, we're done right? It's, yes, you can be strategically aligned and still know that you have to do what you got to do today. Please keep going. I'm in. <laughs> you got it. If we look at this wide funnel here, most of the time people actually create a routine or a calendar the wrong way. They start with activities and move up to strategy and move up to goal. You have to work the other way. So you actually start at the widest part of that funnel is your vision your personal vision. Now there's a personal vision, there's a team vision, there's a corporate vision, we'll touch on this maybe a little later, but right now we're talking about what we can do to create our ideal life right now. Mm -hmm. So on the top is your personal vision. Now, what is a vision? It's a snapshot of your ideal life. So if I gave you a canvas and every color on a palette and I said, there's a snapshot, what would your ideal life look like? Paint it, mm -hmm. paint it. Now a lot of people, they'll start and they say, but that's not realistic, mm, but I'm never going to be able to get that promotion. Oh, you know what? I'm never worthy of making that much money in my career. Well, you've just put a self-imposed limitation on your success. Yeah. When you're creating a personal vision, you have to remove the ceiling of limitations. You have to think bigger than you ever did before, beyond what you think is even possible. There's a reason why I call it your ideal life. Right. So when you're creating a vision, think about every area of your life finances, spirituality, 
faith, community, philanthropic work, health, vitality, travel, family time, personal time, all the things that encompass our life. Take each one of those components and write down, well, if I could have anything, this is what it would look like. Hmm. Now, when people write that, you're going to notice two things. You'll notice as you're writing your personal vision, some of the things actually exist today in your life. That's wonderful. Some of the things you're aspiring to achieve in the future, that's great too. Keep in mind, a vision is a snapshot of your ideal life. So some of those things may exist today. For example, part of my vision is to live in a state of gratitude and also practice extreme self-care. So it's part of my vision. It's part of my ideal life. Now, every day at five in the morning, I wake up, maybe a little earlier. I'll go to the gym for an hour or two every day. It's part of my lifestyle, which we're going to bleed that back into your routine in a few minutes. So I don't need to make that a goal. It's already part of my vision and it lives in my routine. Yeah. So now, if we, again, broad brush, personal vision, ideal life. From there, I want you to pull out your priorities and your values. You'll notice them in your vision. What do you value most? What, do you, what, do you, what are those things that you would use to make yourself fully self-expressed as a human being? What defines who you are? So to give you an example of values, some of my core values, family, adventure, making an impact, contribution, creativity, self-care. So those are all my personal values. So as I'm writing my vision, I'm going to notice some values in there. I'm going to extract them. I'm going to pull them out along with my priorities. So yeah. to me, the three things that always get me out of bed every day, my wife, my three kids, and making an impact right. every single day. And every decision that I make is revolved around those three core values and priorities. Huh, so, yes. Let me let you, real quick, because I, I want to say something to help here. I think if I'm thinking about it, I went to a conference last week and they said, what's your superpower? Right? So you said, well, the thing you moved that I thought was fantastic, I don't want people to miss, was one of the things that gets you out of bed is making an impact. And where I compare that to is with sales folks, a lot of times you're zero to five years and what you're thinking is, oh, I need to be that sales manager or that top producer. But if my superpower isn't the fact that I want to try to get more out of other people and I'd rather just go out and do make an impact individually, you're setting yourself up with the wrong value system. Would you agree with that or am I crazy? No, nope, you're spot on. Okay, go ahead. I apologize. I interrupted. No, I, I appreciate connecting the dots on this. Yeah. You said it a lot more eloquently than I did, Ken, so I appreciate that's, it. That's not true. You're a published best-selling author and I'm a guy hosting a summit. So go oh, ahead. Oh, come on. I'm a humble guy <laughs> at heart, always. Uh, <laughs> So we have our vision, right? And we talked about pulling our vision and our values, for, excuse me, pulling our values and our priorities from our vision. So now you have your vision, you have your priorities and values. Well, what do you think is going to fall right under that? Your goals. Yeah. Now, because you have an eye on your vision and you're mindful of who you are when you're fully self-expressed as a human being, your values, and you're clear about what matters most to you in your life, yeah. only then can you truly develop value-based goals and you know it's a value-based goal if it feels good when you're pursuing it you yeah. know it's a should-based goal if it doesn't feel good if you're struggling with it and you just feel off in your gut yeah yeah oh that's awesome all right cool cool so we've given people a way to align and figure out their goals their superpowers what is it that makes you tick because i think a lot of times you said it very very well you know um lots of people i interviewed tom hopkins you know, and he said, go, if you're new in sales, go find a mentor, right? But I think you're really connecting with what he said, because if I just go find a mentor without the guise of how I actually interpret the information, I could be setting myself up on the wrong path. So you've really done a good job connecting the dots saying, look, that's all great. But does that fall into the things that are ultimately going to lead to your ideal life? So let's move that back. I want to get kind of into the guts of, we've talked about the important, the top end. But tell me about, so I've got goals set, but how do I bleed those goals and, and set those into kind of owning my calendar? You know, it's, <laughs> you, you started this off by saying, I asked people about their calendar and they're like, what are you talking about? So talk to me about how I can use it because I need to control the ability to be productive every day. Billion dollar question. I'm going to answer that right now. 
So the billion dollar question. So everybody write this down because here's the billion dollar answer. The billion dollar answer. Billion dollar question. Billion dollar. This is an exponentially value. Look at that return on investment right there, Ken. Yes. So we, we have our goals. Once you have your goals, then you could say, hmm, here's my goal. Let's say a sales goal. Here's my sales goal. What's my strategy to achieve my goal? Hmm. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's cold calling. Maybe it's upselling and cross-selling. Maybe it's providing um, exemplary customer service. Maybe it's over-delivering on value to my clients. So there's lots of things from a strategic point of view that you can do to achieve your goal, but that's still not enough. So now we have our strategy. What are the activities that are encapsulated in that strategy that's going to move you to your goal? So now we gotta pull out the activities, the daily actions we need to take which again, are aligned with our strategy, which would help us achieve our goal, which would be aligned with our vision, priorities, and values. Right. So now we have these activities. Where do these activities live? All roads go back to time management. All roads go back to your routine. So these activities now get plugged in to your daily calendar. Every day, recurring appointments, whether it's daily or every other day or weekly or, or monthly or yearly, if there's any consistency, it gets plugged into your routine. So now imagine this, waking up in the morning, turn on your computer, and rather than think about what is my day going to look like, your calendar tells you exactly what you need to do while keeping your life in harmony. Uh, well, let's, uh, let, I'm gonna stop you, right? You said challenge you wherever, and we talked about it even before, kind of in our warm up before we hit record, right? But doesn't that mean that I have to be accountable? The big A word? I mean, I, I just, you know, because here's the thing, nobody will tell you they don't want to be accountable. But every, when you said, my calendar tells me exactly what I need to do, there's partially a sense of relief. Hey, I don't got to think about this. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it is, wait a second. My calendar is going to tell me I got to be accountable to it. What do I do when other people call me? What do I do when, you know, every sales emergency that it's ever come up comes up? Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So I, when it comes to uh, accountability and then those daily distractions, which may prevent people from honoring their routine, make sure I don't step over that because, you know, I'm old now, so I might have a senior moment and forget what I need to tell you. <laughs> Looks good on you. I'm thinking about doing it myself. Yeah. I'll catch up to you soon, Ken. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about all the things that go into whether or not you should. But go okay. ahead. Take that offline as well. Yeah. When people say routine and people say, yeah, but, Okay, I have to be accountable. Well, you tell me, do you want to live your ideal life or not? Yeah. Because if you have no desire to, I can't support you as a coach. I just need to know you have this much desire to change. I just need this much. If there's any desire to change, I could coach you and you could achieve unprecedented levels of success. So to me, accountability, that I love being held accountable. Right. My wife is exceptionally good at it. <laughs> my clients are great at it. My kids are great at it. And that's, to me, that's that law of reciprocity. I want to be held accountable because they're only here to support me. My routine, think about this. I empower my routine to hold me accountable. Mm. Because I know if I follow my routine, at the end of the year, I get to look back and say, I achieved all my goals. Because all I did was follow my daily routine. Because if I do that, the byproduct is I achieve my goals and I focus towards creating and manifesting that personal vision. I got now, you. To, to your point, yeah. what if things get in the way? Come on, Keith. That's like Pollyannic. You know, there's no way you could follow a routine perfectly. Well, first of all, let me be clear. There is no such thing as a perfect routine. However, there are things that you can do to make sure you can honor your routine as effectively as possible. So there's a strategy, and here's a very tactical strategy I want to share right now. Yep. that everyone can do right now, today. Good. And that's plan for the unplanned. Plan for the unplanned. That sounds weird, right? Plan for the right. unplanned is like paradox, counterintuitive. What does that yeah. mean? Well, let's do a mathematical equation here. When I work with managers, salespeople, any business professional, and they say to me, Keith, I am not getting everything done. I'm sure you never hear that as well, Ken, right? Yeah, it only happens every single day by 
98% of the people I talk to. But other than that, the other 2% are dialed in. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about those 98% because this is, their, this is the secret to their success right here to honor everything in their day. Now, let's say you work a 10-hour day. Mm -hmm. Now, most people, they'll schedule 10 hours in their day. And at the end of the day, they'll look back and say, ah, I didn't get this done on my task list. I didn't get this done. I, I didn't follow up with this person. I dropped the ball with this coaching session uh, with my customer, with one of my direct reports. And what does that do? It gives us a license to beat ourselves up and make ourselves wrong. Yeah. So what's the solution? Plan for the unplanned. So these things that throw us off our day, someone getting sick, traffic, a fire that needs to be put out, a client emergency, um, you know, someone doesn't show up for work and all of a sudden you have the double workload for the day, uh, a proposal that needs to get out ASAP if you want to close that deal. Anything that is thrown at you that you don't see coming, that flies under your radar, that the only way you'd be able to see that is if you had a crystal ball, is an externality. So we have all these externalities on, the, on our lives that are not going away. So now think of it this way. Think about how much time every day is spent on these externalities. Think about how much time is spent on distractions that need to be handled. I'll say, let's say two hours a day. So you have a 10 hour day and in this example, let's say two hours of your day is filled with things that you can't control that are gonna come up that you're going to inevitably have to handle. How many hours then do you actually have to plan? 10 hours a day, two hours of externalities, you only have eight hours a day. So most people, what they do is they plan for 10. Yeah. You don't have 10, you have eight. So at this point is when a client starts kicking and screaming, they say, well, wait a second, Keith, I need that 10 hours. Okay, you have a choice, wake up earlier or work later because those externalities are still coming at you. So you could not plan for them and create a lesson for disaster or you can plan for them and at the end of the day, pat yourself on the back, look at your calendar and say, I was really ex exceptionally effective and productive today. Yeah, that's great. And I've got a, and I have a good friend and somebody I work with, um, his name is Randy Reimersma, and he talks about if you don't manage your calendar, somebody else will, mm -hmm. right? And so what Either great, great you on your day or your day owns you. Yeah, you just absolutely have no, you have absolutely no choice but to go that route. So that's fan, that's absolutely wonderful stuff. So I think so we've talked a bunch about, you know, everything from vision to tactical actions that we can take to be successful in managing our day, which let's not lose the idea. The reason it's important is everybody has the same amount of seconds, hours, minutes in a day. And the people who get the most done in that time that they allocate to it are the ones who are most successful. And what I love that you've said is, Let's map it to your ideal life. So that doesn't mean I've got to work 14, 18, 20 hours a day, right? No. Bring it back, figure out how to get as much done. In, in if you're, There's a difference between being efficient and effective, wouldn't you say? Yes. You know, so be effective instead of just efficient and we'll find some good stuff. So I want to wrap kind of on the, on the how to own your day. Okay. So give me kind of the, t and we'll move, I want to move into kind of the coaching side of this conversation. But with that being said, if I'm trying to figure out, you already talked about a couple of things, but is there anything else you would add one or two points that I can do today if I'm trying to get better about being more productive? Yes. Right now, I would say for anyone to start this process, first thing I would suggest is track a couple of days. Track maybe two, three days, um, print something out or track it on your phone or your laptop from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep. That's the first thing. And what I find when people do that, Ken, is they have this epiphany moment. They cry. They look at what they're tracking every second of the day. And they, they, they look at this and they realize, wow, I'm actually getting more stuff done than I thought. Yeah. Number two, they realize, gee, things actually take longer than I thought. And the third thing they take away from this exercise is, wow, there are things that I am doing consistently that are not on my calendar. Mm -hmm. So just to bleed this back to another saying, your calendar is lying to you. Because most of the time, if I had a blank piece of paper, here we go. When I ask people to show me their routine, this is what it looks like. Blank piece of paper. Yeah. So I tell them, wait a second. You get, get two appointments on it, right? Exactly right. So <laughs> one appointment, sales call, appointment, appointment. 
And I would ask someone, wait a second, I see you on Monday, you have two appointments, Tuesday, you have three, Wednesday, you have one, Thursday, you have four. Are you telling me this is all you do every day? Yeah. Well, no, no, Keith, I do a lot more than this. I said, well, that's interesting because I don't see that here. Right. So your calendar is actually lying to you. And let's leave that back to another great tip, which is if you don't have every activity in there, that's when you start over committing. Hmm. Because someone's going to ask something from you and you're going to look at your calendar and basically say, oh, I got nothing but time. Yeah. Whenever you want. I got nothing but time. I can over And then you overcommit. So we need to be mindful of putting everything in there because when we do that, our routine actually protects our time. So when someone asks us for something, our response tactically could be, hey, listen, I want to make sure I give what you need from me, the time and the attention it deserves. Uh, let me go back and check my calendar and come back to you and see when I could actually make sure I could make the commitment and honor the commitment I'm making to you. So you've just, you've just created a buffer of time for you to go back and figure out when you can honor that person's commitment. Well, and understand the unmovables on your calendar too. It's okay to be busy. You know, in sales, somehow we've lost the idea that our time is worth money too. As a sales manager, an executive, a leader, a VP, a CEO, right? If we're dealing with a prospect, we're like, oh, prospect, if you want to meet at whatever time it is, I'll make mountains move. But don't they want to deal with people who are successful in business too? I always say you can't take someone where you haven't been yourself. No. Whether you're a salesperson, a leader, or a coach, we need to model what is possible for others. Hmm. If we're not, well, what do you think you're going to attract in your life? Oh my goodness. And it's almost like you knew we were moving to the next topic. And I know you didn't do it intentionally, but so fantastic. So great. You've given us some tactics. How do we own our day, become more productive? And Ken, if I, could, if I could just jump in for yeah. one more second, if it's okay. Uh, I just want to bring that back because you asked me before, what can people do immediately today? Uh, number one, track your day. Number two, write out all the activities that you engage in. Then find a home for them in your calendar. You're going to notice you don't have enough time to get everything done. Yeah. So once you do that, that's the opportunity to start fine tuning your routine, fine tuning your calendars, building in that buffer time every day and taking it out for a test drive. And the first week, you're probably not going to honor your routine. And when clients come to me and they say, Hey, Keith, I only honored my routine 5% of the time. I'm going to say, congratulations. Yeah. That's 5% more productive than they were the week before. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure I share that with people. And the last part about a routine is people have a reaction about it's too rigid. And I just want to share this last point and then we can move on. Yeah. I want you to treat your routine like a puzzle. So if you blocked out everything in your calendar each day, and let's say you have 10 things blocked out an hour each for your 10 hour day. Well, you have these time blocks. Now imagine you have a puzzle and that puzzle, every piece is the same size and the same color. So wherever you move them around, it's still the same picture. Mm -hmm. Now think of your routine. Wherever you move those pieces of your puzzle around in your day, it still totals up to 10 hours. Yeah. So it's counterintuitive, but actually your routine gives you more flexibility in your day because you're focusing on the right activities that are going to move you to your goals. Awesome. Great tips, great advice. And I would add in there, when they do this, I'm sure you're going to say yes every time you check your email. So don't even write it down, but put check email and then use a tally system because the 12 times you check your email every day are costing you an hour a day, right? Turn off automated download, make it manual. Because if you're scheduling your emails to download every five minutes, what you have done is you have created a distraction for yourself every five minutes. Whew. Yeah, that's great. And your lizard brain is not meant to deal with that. So <laughs> great stuff. So let's, so let's talk about this. Cause so first of all, it's productivity. And the reason I love these two subjects together is that, you know, marketing donut did a study, which people have seen when they registered for the summit that said 8% of all salespeople are taking home 80% of all the commissions. And so I really align that to two core philosophies. It's not about, can I, you know, can you teach me to close more deals, Ken? It's not about, hey, I'm going to go watch every expert who knows closing and negotiation only. Because really, most of the time, it's a problem that happens way earlier. And I think the skill set, the two things that we get jacked up in are productivity, right? Do I do enough with the time I have available to me? And then I think the second component is coaching's completely misunderstood. And I know that this is a, just a core belief system of yours, 
And I want to start with the most difficult question out there. That is this. We all, may, I've seen it and I know you have. They take the top performing sales guy who believes that based upon his, where he is, that he should be a manager. Because you know what? I'm the top performer in sales. Nobody does it better than me. Promote me to sales manager. And then they suck. That happens? So much so that they call it the Peter principle. So <laughs> with that being said, I understand that you might have a way that we can avoid this conundrum. Tell I us. actually have the answer. This, this timeless universal epidemic, this, yeah. this global conundrum. I've heard it from literally every client. At some point, they hire the top person and it's just not a right fit. And what happens? They don't provide the training and development for the manager. So what does the manager do? they default to either being the chief problem solver and solve all their salespeople's problems because that's what they know. They know sales. Right. Or they start one up doing their salespeople's job. Yeah. And then they turn around and wonder why they have no time every day. Right. right. So what's the solution here? How do you develop an autonomous, accountable, self-motivated sales team and at the same time develop your managers and build that strong bench of future leaders for the organization? The answer is actually quite simple that I stumbled upon several years ago. Now I've been doing this for 30 years now, created the niche of executive coach training, leadership coach training for organizations, how leaders truly need to transform into world-class coaches. Yeah. That's where I started this evolution of thought years ago. The next evolution of thought is now coaching your salespeople to become world-class coaches. That is the evolution of selling. Not more sales training, not more closing techniques, but how do you take a salesperson and make them a consultative sales coach? So now think about this for a second. We're gonna marry all this together here. Yeah. From a cultural perspective, when clients ask me, Keith, how do you shift the culture? How do you change a culture? Well, the answer is actually very simple. It's one person at a time. It's one conversation at a time. Wait, wait, go back and say that, say that again. So if you're an entrepreneur or you're a sales manager, do not skip over this. So say what you said again. How do you change a culture? You change a culture one person at a time, one conversation at a time. Hmm. Companies, managers, they feel overwhelmed about thinking the notion of changing a culture is so overwhelming. It's like turning a battleship. Yeah. But when you break it down to just that next conversation, you can make a huge impact. And you can create a breakthrough. And then that next conversation, you can do the same thing. And then you can do it with someone else on your team. And before you know it, you have a coaching subculture in your team. And that then expands to the organization. So when we're talking about sales leadership, and we're talking about coaching our people, and we're talking about eradicating this, this issue of developing a sale, of taking a salesperson and putting them to management and they fail. The answer is if you develop your salespeople into world-class coaches when they're in a sales role, what's going to happen when they get promoted? Yeah. Oh my gosh, they're already trained as coaches. They're already going to be able to make an impact immediately on their team because that is the culture. It's a coaching culture. The methodology, the mindset, and the skill set was embedded as soon as this person was onboarding into their first sales role. So when they, when they evolve and, and they get promoted into their management role, they already have that mindset as a coach. Mm. That's the secret. Okay, that's the secret, but let's dig through some stuff, right? So CSO Insights releases a report and, you know, I know that stuff's self-reported, but let's call it directionally accurate, right? <laughs> so they release a report that basically says that you think salespeople are hurting for coaching, managers are getting crushed. They're getting no development, nothing at all. So here's what I want to ask. If I'm a sale, if I'm a seller, if I'm a B2B salesperson and I'm getting limited instruction from management, the company's not going to buy this type of thing to teach my manager. Talk to me about how I, what can I embrace, right? What I can I as a seller embrace to, I, to become more coachable and to help influence that culture on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Are you talking about from the salesperson's perspective or the sales manager's perspective? Tell me from the salesperson, let's work up because I That's think, interesting. you know, because in a lot of cases, I think it's that we have a lot of like, there's 14 million salespeople in America or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, there's, I don't know, 10 million of them aren't getting great coaching. 
probably 13.9 million. Right. So in a lot of cases, we, it, we almost have to look at this like a grassroots rebellion. Okay. So how do I become better there? And then we can talk about what the sales manager can do too. But I don't know if anyone's put the question to you that way, but I guess I'm putting you on the spot. No, I got it. And I'll give you it in two words. Coach up. Okay. Talk to me about that. Perfect segue to what we just talked about, Ken. Yep. We just talked about how uh, the greatest salespeople are great coaches. Mm -hmm. And we now talked about developing your salespeople into world-class coaches. So not only are you developing your competitive edge, but they're coaching their customers su to succeed and they're prepared for their next career advancement. Okay. In that skill set of coaching, it also includes coaching up. So this is about the salesperson going to their manager and requesting coaching from them. Often, we can't blame our manager for every single problem. We could try, many do. Yeah. We could. But the salesperson who's looking for good coaching, they can wait for their manager to come to them and give them good coaching, but they may be waiting their entire career. And it's not because the manager's a bad manager and it's not because the manager is a bad coach. It could just be because the manager didn't recognize what your personal needs were. So if that's the case, and I'm a salesperson desperately looking to develop myself and get coaching, I have an opportunity to go to my manager and enroll them in coaching me. And that could sound as simple as, hey, Ken, listen, I really appreciate everything you do. And I really value you as a manager and someone who, who could really help me in my development. Mm -hmm. I would love to create some type of cadence so I can tap into your wisdom because I know that uh, you can help me succeed. And by you helping me succeed, it's going to help the team succeed. So can we discuss some ways where I can leverage you as a resource to help me become more successful? Yep. So, and I want to back up real quick though, because one of the things you said, I find so perfect. And that is that each person is different. And so as a salesperson or a sales manager, we do have to realize that we, and it's because you said manage by one small conversation at a time, right? Which implies one-on-one, -on -one, right? But we have to understand that Different people receive and need different skills. And I, as an individual, have to understand in order to coach up that my sale, that I need to be able to convey what I'm looking for. Because so often, you know, you go into a one on one review, right? And it's, you got pipeline review and you got skills dev, right? And the two things in there, and they say, what can we do to help you with your skills dev today? And you, I don't know. <laughs> I'm good. Sense of self awareness. We're so worried about getting out the door from the one on one. But there's a sense of self-awareness that has to come. You think that's true? When we're moving at the speed of light right now, I think that's why coaching gets the backseat to so many things. And I get a little tired going into companies where they're telling me, oh, our people are number one, our people are number one, our people are number one, they're our priority, as long as they hit their number. Yeah, prove it, right? Yeah. So wait a second, are you putting results over people? Most companies do. I don't care what their vision statement says. I'm behind the boardroom with these companies. I see what's going on, you yeah. know, and if they were really putting their people first, then the first question a manager asks themselves when they wake up in the morning isn't, what do I need to do to achieve my business objectives every day? The first question a manager would ask every morning is, what do I need to do today to make my people more valuable than they were yesterday? Mm. That's the mindset of a world-class leader. Yeah. So when you're talking about coaching, and I would, I would welcome you to ask me that different, that question again, Ken, in a different way. Yeah. Can you ask me that question again? That you Which just one? <laughs> now the we're question. both having senior moments. Yeah. The, the, are you talking about the question about how the individual salesperson comes up? Thank you very much. Tapping yep. into people's individuality. Yeah. So every, as you said before, I, I made a, a, a comment about how do you change your culture one person at a time? Yeah. How do we as managers tap into the individuality of each person? Well, the same way a salesperson would tap into the individuality of each prospect or customer, yeah. seeking to understand by asking better questions. Most managers will make costly assumptions about what motivates their team. And they'll even make a gross assumption that, well, all sales, salespeople are coin operated. Right. They're all money motivated. Which well, is the biggest bunch of malarkey in the history of world because we all have Look at every HR blog in the history of the world, right? People are motivated by something else. Money's just the byproduct. Exactly right. It's usually three or four on the list where number one is acknowledgement, recognition, being part of something, making a difference, collaboration. That's what they want.
That's what people want today. Yeah. So when we as, as salespeople go to our managers and asking for coaching, that creates an environment now where the salesperson is actually creating a coaching culture. So I just want to make sure salespeople out there listening don't think you can't impact your culture. You are the most important person in the organization because you're the one bringing in the business every day. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're, and if you're a sales manager or a salesperson and the conversation starts with, I'm frustrated, but you never asked a question to figure out why something was happening, know that you're not asking great questions, right? Let's, let's even take that. Uh, there's a concept I talk about phraseology. I'm going to be spending a lot of time on this concept in my next book. Okay. And phraseology is coaching the words, the power of words to amplify your level of mindfulness and self-awareness in a conversation. Unfortunately, when you're moving so fast and you're so result driven, and you said before, we got a pipeline review, got our you know, skill set review, we're going to mix it all together, we're going to move out. You're not even listening for the coaching moments. So a salesperson can go to a manager and say, hey, listen, I'm feeling really overwhelmed because this customer is frustrating me and they're being really, really difficult. The manager can respond with, okay, great. What do you need me to do? You need me to make a call? Or, you know what? Just keep working on that deal. I know you're going to close it. Yeah. What the manager didn't do is take the time to even understand what words like frustrated, overwhelmed, difficult, successful, value, what does that mean? I yeah. love when uh, managers tell their sales team to sell value. Yeah. Ken, go out and sell value, okay? I'm in, I'm out. The heck does that even mean? Right. Every, that's a different connotation in each person. You go around a room and ask each person what success is, you're going to get a different definition. So it's such a great coaching moment when people throw words like that. You know what? I'm, I'm not feeling confident. Well, help me understand. What does confident mean to you? Or I'm really worried about whether or not I'm going to close this deal. Well, help me understand more about that. When you say worry, how do you mean? Yeah. Now you're going to be able to uncover the gap in the coaching moment to make a measurable impact on that person. Yeah, and let's tie that together. So because, you know, when we start talking about emotions, we get some people kind of, gla you know, they're glazing over and falling back. But let me make this, let me tie this together. Words matter. And a, a perfect example, if you're in technology sales or any other kind of sales and somebody says to you, I don't have the resources, right? We assume we know what that means, but is that time? Is that money? Is that people? And it's the exact, all the stuff that you're saying right now, Keith, is the exact same, right? We just... We get stuck in this fast-paced thing. That's just wonderful insight. And I really, really appreciate you drawing that out. So as we, we're going to kind of start to wrap up here. So tell me this, you know, kind of on the way out, I've got a couple questions left, but on the way out, if I was trying to impact my pipeline, whether I'm a sales, sales manager, if I wanted to make sure that I had a predictable impact on my pipeline over the coming six months or a year, what's the best advice you could give me? managers as they're coaching and now I'm making an assumption that the manager actually knows how to coach effectively mm -hmm. the opportunity more now than they did before so i think we're in a good spot go ahead fair enough there's two opportunities that are i see that often missed in, in the spirit of driving sales targets and achieving those goals number one managers are missing the opportunity to actually coach on time management mm -hmm. tying back to that yeah. number two Managers don't really understand how to leverage their CRM as coaching opportunities. Hmm. They use it more as micromanaging. They definitely have visibility, but it's more from a place of, hey, you know, why isn't this deal moving forward? You need to move this deal forward. Right. Gee, boss, thanks for that awesome coaching. I feel really empowered now. I know exactly what I need to do. Right. Rather than say, hey, I noticed this deal's been stuck at 30%. You know, walk me through what's been going on since then. What was the last conversation you had with that customer? What did it sound like? Help me understand how you uncovered the decision makers, influences, and advocates. How do you know what value means to them? What's the value proposition that they were intrigued by that we could deliver for them? If the salesperson can't answer those questions, there are a lot of assumptions that that salesperson made throughout the initial stage of their process, which probably goes all the way back to their qualifying. And it's inevitable how we spend so much time talking about the importance of qualifying. And it's amazing how every company I work with, 
they always have key questions missed, which you know as well as I do, is gonna bite you at the end yeah. when you ask for the business. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, I follow a guy, my kids do CrossFit and I've done it and there's a, there's a coach who's coached a couple of the you know, fittest people in the world, right? His name is Ben Bergeron. And he actually coaches the idea, and I, I know you've seen this too, where you've got ways that you can handle it. You've got an event, you've got the response, and then you've got the outcome, mm -hmm. right? And we spend so much time in sales worrying about the outcome that we've completely forgotten the front half of the equation, right? We're worried about winning and closing a deal. And what you said is absolutely perfect. Most of the time, when we get to the very front end, we realize that's where we screwed it up. Um, we, were we had a new consulting client come on and was talking with Randy and he said, well, why aren't you so excited? I said, well, because to me, the close is just the inevitable outcome of everything we did in the middle. You know, so I think, so I think you're absolutely uh, right on there. So that's a great tip for sales managers. Hey, and Ken, if I could just, I wanna, I'd love to finish that thought, that you, if I could piggyback on that. Yeah. Companies, salespeople, and managers need to make a fundamental shift in their thinking to be more process-driven yeah. rather than result driven. And that, and I wanted to make sure I said what you said in a different way. so People can really hear this. When you're a metrics driven, result driven, KPI driven culture, you're focused on the result. So now where's your thinking in the future? Well, if your thinking is in the future, you're not focused on how to get there. Yeah. It's pushing for the result. You don't coach the result. You coach the process. So if companies shift their thinking to be more process driven, be more process driven, it manifests in their behavior and the quality of their questions are going to be more process driven rather than result driven. It's a balance. The results are important. I'm not saying they're not, but in order to get there to your point, we need to master the process and the skills. So good. So I had another question. I'm not even going to ask that one. I'm just going to kind of skip to the end here because that was just a fantastic way to wrap this together. The importance of managing your calendar, understanding how that leads to your ideal life state, seeking coaching from a sales perspective and from a management perspective, understanding that we have to coach to the individual, to the person, and that they have their own things they're trying to achieve. You've just absolutely slayed it today. Um, but tell me this, I know that people are going to go, okay, this Keith Rosen guy, it's the first or the hundredth time that I've been exposed to him. Tell me how they can find more about you online or wherever you'd like them to learn more about you. Appreciate that. They could jump on my website, coachquest.com or my blog at keithrosen.com. Tons of resources, uh, downloads, templates, tools for sales leaders and salespeople that will truly make you the best you you can be. Awesome. Give me a uh, you Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, to, back to your point about uh, coaching and time management, bringing this all together. I, I don't want to leave without sharing this with our audience here. Okay. Is that whether you're a salesperson supporting a customer or you're a manager supporting your team. If I am a manager and I don't get coaching, like not get it as understanding, I don't get it from my boss. Right. Okay. Or as a manager, I haven't mastered my time. I may not see how important it is to other people. Mm. And I will step over those opportunities. And it even goes back to time management. If I am not great at managing my day, how can I recognize the gap in others or even coach them for them to master their day? So it has to begin with the leader. All roads go back to us, avalanches roll downhill. So when you are as a manager have learned, and when I say master, you don't have to be a master yeah. at this to start coaching people. It could be a collaborative journey that you're working with your people on. How amazing is that to align that? You're asking help for your team. You're going to be helping your team. You do it together. So now you're working on these routines. Well, you asked me before about accountability. Now imagine this. Salesperson sitting down doing a one-on-one -on -one with their manager, pipeline review. Manager looks at their pipeline and they're wondering why their production is down. The activity is down. Imagine now, rather than trying to figure out where the gap is, the manager turns to the salesperson and says, hey, uh, why don't we take a look at your calendar and see how you've organized that for the week? Because your calendar, if organized correctly with the right activities, is going to, like you said, lead them to their goal and to their sales target as a natural byproduct. So now think about how much 
infinitely easier it is for managers to coach their people on productivity. They just need to look at their calendar. And if it's well designed, it, the question is, are you honoring it or not? And if not, let's work together on what we need to do to refine it so you can. Yeah, you may have a sports car sitting out in your, in your parking lot, but you're trying to whip it with a buggy whip by just beating it up, right? Let's put some oil in it. Let's give it something that it can do to actually move forward. So that's great. And I know we didn't talk about this, but the last thing, give me the quick blurb. I know that you were just in the process of finishing your uh, latest book. Uh, just give, give us a quick blurb so they can look out for that as it comes out. Sure. That's been a process over the last 10 years since coaching salespeople into sales champions came out. This book really picks up where coaching salespeople into sales champions left off. Yeah. I've taken my years of global travel being in over 70 countries on five continents. And this book really has more of a global perspective, not just that myopic U S perspective, yeah. but a global perspective yeah. so that every manager worldwide can connect and relate to these because I share stories working with managers and leaders across the world. So very tangible stories, being mindful of cultural differences and nuances, because coaching is truly a universal language. Perfect. And as we talked about, and this is, this summit is beyond my, beyond my wildest dreams with, we're getting all, you know, I don't know, four corners of the world, so to speak. I'm sure there's more in a circle or a globe, but, <laughs> but we've got them in Australia and the UAE and India and Canada and in Mexico and everywhere. So um, I know they're going to look for that. So Keith, I'm humbled that you would choose to spend, uh, you know, an hour with me and, and the folks here at the B2B Sales Summit, and you've just dropped in a tremendous amount of knowledge that I know that if people will go out and actively apply it, that they will be able to change not only their sales careers, but they'll actually be able to continue to build towards that ideal life that you so eloquently spoke about at the beginning of the summit. So I thank you humbly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. All right. We'll see you on the other side, buddy.